So the RC Hypercar project has been going on for a little over a year now, but we finally have some real numbers showing what the RC Hypercar is actually capable of. And it's actually pretty insane. Well over four lateral Gs, that's Formula One-like handling in an RC car. When I started the research on this project, all the skeptics uh, told me that aerodynamics don't matter at the RC car scale, or that the RC car would never be able to go fast enough. The ground effects will never work on a small car like this. But thanks to partnerships from companies like AirShaper, who helped me to work out all of the CFD analysis for the car, I knew that if the car generated even half the downforce that the CFD indicated, this car was going to absolutely destroy any existing RC car out there. And it has. So I'm completely floored that this car is pulling over four lateral G's at peak. Uh, I don't have the GPS data yet, but it's definitely less than a 65 mile an hour top speed. So this is by far better than a Formula One car at these low speeds. Uh, we're talking time attack or Pike's Peak levels of downforce. Um, obviously, I didn't initially believe these figures and accelerometer data is notoriously noisy. Uh, so I delved into the data deeper. Uh, I've been using a Bosch BNO85 uh, inertial measurement unit, which has a really nice IMU with a onboard ARM Cortex processor to help filter out all of the data, uh, but it's a closed source firmware, so you don't necessarily know what's going on inside the IMU. So to get a clearer picture, I set up the ESP32 I've been using to log uh, the accelerometer data onto an SD card at 200 hertz. And to make certain it wasn't something with the Bosch IMU, I calibrated and hooked up an MPU 6050 and an ICM 20948 IMU at the same time. Uh, the good thing is all three accelerometers were actually in agreement, uh, slightly out of phase just to due to differences in internal filtering. And now I had a ton of data to actually work with and determine how accurate all of these readings are. Uh, regardless, the data is very messy because the car is bouncing around everywhere. Uh, this parking lot that I'm running on is a very rough concrete surface, so the car is bouncing a lot. I had over a million data readings from all of the tests. I ran it through a bunch of different digital filters. Uh, so this is just a small sample here. Uh, but it's very easy to see how you can under or even over filter your data. Ultimately, I feel pretty comfortable with the numbers of being somewhere around four G's of lateral peak. It could be a bit lower or it could be a lot higher, uh, but this is still on $12 cheap Amazon tires. I think there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, particularly in the sustained lateral G area. Obviously, if you haven't checked out the build series, definitely check it out because these tests are the culmination of several months of design and engineering. I'm not going to go back through all of uh, the development of the car itself. I'm going to kind of skip ahead. This is version three of the car. I'm going to try to cover the major changes since uh, version two. 
So aerodynamically, the front upper wing here uh, between the fenders and the monocoque has been shrunken and moved as far forward as possible. Uh, this improved the air evacuation from behind the front wing and shifted the downforce a little bit more forwards. It also has been raised by four millimeters because it was interacting a little bit too much with the high pressure field on top of the lower front wing and actually not making as much downforce. Uh, previously, the car had excessive rear downforce just because I had a giant rear wing on the car. And you can see really clearly in Air Shaper that the coefficient of lift of the front was much lower than the rear. In fact, if the front wing stalled, the rear wing would actually lift the front of the car off of the ground. So I tried a smaller rear wing with an adjustable second element. Uh, the car drives really nicely with this wing, uh, but you can actually balance the car so it's very drivable and doesn't uh, spin out unless you're just silly with the throttle application. Uh, the previous rear wing was just understeer all of the time. Uh, the biggest issue is that you can see in the CFD test results that the giant rear wing really helped to generate downforce from the underfloor. And now the underfloor actually generates a significantly lower amount of front downforce. So I really haven't shifted the balance as much as I was hoping with this particular wing. And I might try something like a beam wing or something like that, uh, which is just a lower wing element to try to uh, energize the diffuser a little bit more. But to try to counteract this loss of front downforce in the underfloor, I needed a higher downforce front wing. So if you remember in version two, the front wing was too low to the ground and the front suspension wasn't stiff enough to hold it up and keep it from stalling. So I designed a new nose and a new front wing that's roughly four millimeters higher up off of the ground. Uh, it's a two element wing with some really big gurney flaps and it's reasonably good at not stalling. Uh, I also run about four degrees of negative angle of attack on the first element to really drive as much air as possible under the wing and feed the underfloor diffuser. Uh, but you can see that the front wing is still hitting the ground a lot, uh, which causes the wing to stall. I did wind some custom uh, springs for the front end of the car and they're much stiffer than the rear springs. Uh, but uh, they're still not going to be stiff enough for what I think I need. Uh, partially this is just due to the terrible parking lot I'm testing in being very bumpy and rough. And partially it's the actual front suspension itself. So for version 3 I did print out the front control arms out of a very stiff 20% uh, glass filled nylon. Uh, the control arms themselves being extremely stiff helps to keep them from bending but the pull rod geometry in the front suspension is just really bad just due to packaging constraints. Uh, the pull rod is at 19 degrees uh, from the wheel. And you ideally, I think in most race cars want something above 30 degrees. And so this results in a really poor transfer of force uh, between the wheel and the pull rod. In fact, the pull rod experiences over 10 kilograms or 22 pounds of force. Uh, so if there's any slop in the joints or if the pull rod is a bit elastic, uh, the front suspension is really bending rather than transferring uh, the force from the wheel back into the springs into the damper. So I really need a new front suspension design again. Probably one that actually puts the pull rod pickup point on top of the control arm so that we can get a better angle for the pull rod and it's just more efficient. And I maybe I might use a carbon fiber rod inside um, some 3D printed parts uh, just to try to stiffen the pull rod up as much as possible. Also for version 3, not exciting at all, but I did move the servo rearwards uh, 5 millimeters because the monocoque was just too thin at the bottom of where the servo mounted. And I lengthened the steering arms a bit on the spindles, which just gives the servo a bit more leverage which I think is good for this high down force, uh, but the steering is a bit slower and it's only a $15 servo, so it's not the greatest. So the cool thing about version three was I was able to run it a lot more than any of the previous versions. And in relatively hot weather as well, 100 plus degree uh, Fahrenheit temperatures. But I did run into a lot more issues uh, as I got more miles on the car. I found out that the RC car 
touring sedan tires can vary in diameter between the brands and uh, you can wear them down by a couple of millimeters as well. Uh, they also have this rounded profile. Uh, so when the tires are turning, uh, the height of the car is actually changing quite a bit. And this can cause the car to run too low to the ground. So I need to make some suspension changes to raise the entire car up about three millimeters. It's not the easiest thing to do with these flexor joints. Uh, all of the control arms uh, basically have a static ride height and I need to essentially raise that ride height or make some sort of spindles that actually increase the ride height some. Uh, the rear motors are actually getting really hot and I may have actually burnt one out. I think it's just too much amperage going through those two small motors. Uh, they're only a 900 kV 2812 uh, on the rear motors. I've originally debated putting in larger rear motors, which I might try someday, but I think right now the better approach is to actually do as I originally intended with the car and go with four motors, one in each wheel. Uh, this splits the available power across the four motors, so overall they should run much cooler. The overall power of the car is actually really severely limited uh, by the battery itself. Uh, you can tell when the car is driving, you can actually just have a short burst of full acceleration and high speed. And then after that, it's probably about 20% slower. It's actually a really big difference. In fact, to do the lateral G acceleration test runs, I have to run on a fully charged battery, warm the tires up with as little power as possible, and then make just a couple of top speed laps at full throttle. Uh, I can tell the car is actually slowing down even dramatically after one lap of full throttle. And if you know anything about aerodynamics, downforce increases as the square of velocity. So even a five to seven mile an hour loss in top speed is huge. So I'm definitely gonna get a better battery for the car, one that has about uh, double the C rating. So that will be very good for the car. After the last video, one of the viewers put me on to these four in one drone ESCs that are running the AM32 firmware, which actually supports RC cars, unlike a uh, BL Heli 32 and other firmwares like that. And these ESCs are about half the weight of the two ESCs I already have in there. And it would let me run a forest battery as well. So again, we could have potentially more top speed yet. So I have one of those ESCs on order to try it out and see if I can keep it uh, cool enough in an RC car. Also, there are a bunch of durability issues that have cropped up with the, all this extended testing. The first one is that the rear wheels have these lugs on them that, so that when they're tightened, they don't loosen when driving. Uh, these particular motors are only offered in a clockwise thread configuration. So on the one side, the bolt was coming loose with all of the torque. Uh, so this helps to lock it to the motor, but the motors were getting so hot that these started to shear right off. The front spindle design with the 3D printed spindle balls isn't actually perfect and they wear out fairly quickly. I'm going to try and print them out of nylon and I think that should make them last a lot longer. Ideally, I'd find some sort of machine solution uh, using Delrin or PTFE uh, rather than these 3D printed parts. Um, but for now, uh, I can keep replacing those and it's not a big deal. On the rear spindles, the ball joints keep coming loose or actually cracking the rear spindle at the layer lines. Uh, I've ordered some through hole drilled uh, ball joints that will let me put an M3 screw all the way through the ball joint itself so that I can put the ball joint up in a double shear setup and actually make the uh, rear suspension actually much uh, easier to remove. Previously I talked about the tires being an issue so I talked to Sweep Racing and I was able to buy some unmounted uh, belted tires and much firmer inserts. So hopefully that's going to address the car's appetite for tires. The most exciting thing I have coming on the RC Hyper Car project is the actual electronics. Uh, PCB Way reached out to me and asked if I needed some custom PCBs for this project. And I was like, definitely. Uh, I've just gotten the PCBs in and they're actually beautiful. Uh, I designed two custom PCBs, one for the main controller board itself and another for a set of high speed magnetic encoders so that we have wheel speed sensors in each of the wheels. 
uh, this being my second ever PCB design, PCB Way did a great job of actually assembling the SMD components for me and uh, even working with me to help clarify some of the component mounting on the actual wheel sensors. So the main controller board is still kind of a prototype board. Uh, so I don't have all of the components broken out into like SMDs. Um, so the board's a little bit bigger than it needs to be, but we'll have two ESP32s, uh, mainly for the amount of IO and processing we have to do on the sensor data. Uh, we'll have SD card data logging, and also I can store some of the settings in the SD card as well for the car. It will have a nice uh, GPS sensor. It will have uh, wheel speed sensors on each of the wheels. It'll have the nine axis Bosch IMU. It will have uh, voltage monitoring of the battery pack, and eventually I will add a amperage sensor onto the battery, as well as some laser time of flight height sensors too, so that I can actually measure the ride height of the car real time. Oh, and I had to add some transistors so that we can drive some ultra bright LED tail lights, because what's a race car without a flashing red tail light? With all this data and processing power, um, we can do some really cool things like torque vectoring and traction control over the next several videos. Uh, so thank you to PCB Way. Uh, for the next video, my goal is to wire up all of these electronics and boards, uh, which is no small task in this car, and write software for the microcontroller so that they can exchange data and process all of the incoming sensor information. And then we can actually make this car into an all-wheel drive monster. So. Thanks for watching and uh, stay safe out there.